All right, the recording started, so we'll go ahead and get going with this morning's webinar. Hello, everyone. My name is David Crawley Delgado. I am part of the City of Glendale's economic development team here. Um, and I'm joined by some of the others on our team. We're very, very happy to welcome you this morning to the first of our Let's Go Glendale, pardon me, Let's Grow Glendale webinar series. Uh, this is a series that's going to be leading up to our Small Business Summit uh, and really just created to support all of you, the small businesses that really make the, up the beating heart of the wonderful city of Glendale. Uh, so this topic today is going to be around time management. We're incredibly fortunate to have an expert speaker on this subject uh, who's going to be leading this and all of the other webinars, um, Eddie Sumar. Eddie is the founder of ERS Consulting Services in Rancho Cucamonga and patron of the Otis Dream Project, Education Without Borders in Zambia, Africa. He's an award-winning international trade financing consultant, and a consultant with Synergist, and the Chief of Education and Youth Skills Development for the Inland Empire Regional Chamber of Commerce. He was also recently appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Commerce to serve as a member of the California Inland Empire District Export Council uh, for the term of 2020 through 2027. In his free time, he has also authored 17 books <laughs> and workbooks. Uh, so a very, very prolific writer, uh, really has uh, so much wisdom to share in this space. And so we're incredibly fortunate to have him here with us today. Uh, he's a public speaker and as is clear by the books, so he enjoys writing, uh, but he also enjoys traveling. So he's, uh, he shared with us that he's traveled to over 143 countries and counting. So we're, like I mentioned, incredibly a fortunate to have Mr. Sumar here today. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to him to lead this today's session. One quick note, uh, please make sure that you are putting yourself on mute. Uh, if you're newer to Zoom, you should find the mute button uh, down in the bottom left corner if you're on a computer or if you're on your phone, uh, then you can just click the screen and you'll find a little mute key there. We will have opportunities to answer questions during the middle of the session. So free, feel free to put any questions that you might have in the chat and we will be monitoring it and read questions from the chat. If there's any need for clarification, we might ask you to unmute yourself uh, so that we can engage in a little bit more of a discussion. Uh, but now I'll officially hand it over. So Mr. Sumar, thank you so much for joining us today and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Jennifer. I want to thank all the team from Bradley, Shu, and Jenny, and all of you, and the City of Glendale Community Development and Economic Development Department. In fact, I love Glendale. I lived there 11 years. <laughs> so the city is amazing, but in order to buy a house that I could afford, we had to go east. We ended up in Rancho Cucamonga. So that's why, but Glendale is very important part of my history. Uh, so I learned a lot in Glendale. So, and today it's going to be, it's really a privilege to be uh, really helping the small business in the city of Glendale, because I believe it's a beacon of progress. Look, uh, look, Brand Boulevard, it's really amazing, all the different businesses there. But what makes economic development successful is the small business. Because when we look at these big conglomerates, at these big companies, they all started small. Like any tree, it started with a seed. And that seed took time to grow. Today, we are going to really focus on time management. How to our, we are going to make time count. Because what's really interesting many times is when we think in terms of uh, time management, some people just count time. They clock in at 8 in the morning, they want to leave at 5. During that time, they are busy, but are they productive? When we think of time management, it's not just about how to manage time, but can we achieve our goals? Can we achieve the results that we intend to achieve on the personal level and on the professional level? Also, I want to dispel a myth. We can never manage time. Why? Time is one directional. We hear the expression, I'm saving time. Sorry, we cannot save it. Oh, I'm not managing time. Sorry, time keeps going on. The only thing we can do really is managing self in the context of time. 
That's it. Which means when we think of time management, we are thinking in managing ourselves, our own moods, our own mindset, our own point of view, our energies in the context of time. Because every single one of the, us, we have 24 hour days. We don't have 24 and a half or 25 hours or 23. We all have equal 24 hours. The same amount of minutes, the same amount of seconds. But what differentiates one from another is how we manage ourselves in the context of time. So sad to say, some people count time, but others make time count. And that is exactly what we are going to be doing. We are going to learn how to make time count, how to achieve our goals and aspirations, how to achieve our dreams. If you're working for a company, how to achieve the ultimate profitability, the goodwill of your customers, the loyalty of your customer. Many people think, how does customer loyalty link to time? It has a lot of, uh, a great deal to deal with time management. If I'm in customer service, I might have a hundred phone calls that day, how I manage my queue, how I respond to the calls, how I respond to my emails, my messages, my communication in a timely manner is going to either end up with a happy, delighted customer or with a disgusted customer. Imagine today in the age of technology, before a manager will ask a team to say, give me a report and we'll wait a week and we'll be happy to receive the report at the end of the week. We had monthly reports in the past. A few years ago, a report has to be done from uh, evening to morning. Now, instant. If I don't get the report within seconds, people are not happy. So we use technology to manage time, to manage our productivity. So today I'm going to teach you as many tools. I will give you all tips of the trade, how to manage self in the context of money. Two tools are going to be key in our lives, the matrix, and I'll explain later what it means, and then the 80-20 rule. If we can master the 80-20 rule on a daily basis, you are going to be amazing in managing self in the context of money. So now, what is the agenda for today? And feel free at any moment, if you have any idea, feel free to put it in the chat, interrupt me, that's okay. Unmute and I will answer because I prefer, especially today, at the click of a mouse, people want responses, fine, do the same with me. If you have something on your mind, you want a quick answer, just unmute or write in the chat and Jennifer will be monitoring the chat and tell me what the question and I will answer it at that moment. So what's the agenda? Why do we need time management? What are the benefits of time management? What are the time wasters? Underline the word wasters. You'll be surprised on a daily basis when we wake up until we go to sleep, there are lots of time wasters. We have to be masters of our destiny, of our to-do list. So don't waste your time. Don't waste it. We know time is cannot be wasted or saved or controlled or managed, but we are wasting our energies. We are wasting our effort on things that don't bring us the results, don't achieve our personal dreams and aspirations and the vision and mission of our corporations and professional ends. What are the areas related to time management? And this is very important, having a system. One thing you are going to, to learn today that if you have a system, you'll be far more successful than someone who doesn't have a system. We will learn about the productivity pyramid, the can-do attitude, the can-do is an acronym for a system, and then the importance of scheduling and prioritizing. And at the end, we'll have a putting together, a synthesis of everything we, are, we talked about. Why do we need time management? Just look at this slide. Every day we wake up, we, we, we go through a series of crises. How many times during the day you say, help? How many times do they say, I'm buried in paperwork, I'm buried in texts and emails. Like every, every morning I get up, I have hundreds of emails in my queue. Sometimes when I go out of town in three, four days, I have thousands of emails. 
that is, I'm buried in email. Do I have a system to weed out those emails to stay in control? Do you have a feeling that you are sinking under the weight of your work, your obligation, your duties, the things around you? Again, today we are going to show you, don't worry. Don't have that sinking feeling. Don't feel buried. And yes, when need be, ask for help, delegate, refer. I'll teach you some techniques that will help you really to always sail to your destination smoothly and lightly. Are you juggling among multiple priorities? Notice the word I'm using, priorities. All of us on a daily basis, we face enormous amount of priorities. A good example is our bodies tell us to prioritize air. Because what happens if I don't take breath for just two to five minutes? I'll be dead after five minutes. My brain will be dead. Some paramedics tell me somebody was able to stay alive after 12 minutes without air, which means breathing is a priority. Thank God that our bodies help us to breathe without us telling it how to breathe, when to breathe, and so forth. Because biologically and physiologically, we cannot continue living without breathing, drinking. Within a week, we break down. Eating in 70 days without, uh, without eating, even just with drinking, will break down. Sleeping. Here is another thing. You want to manage your efforts, your, your mental acuity, sleep. I call that the C metaphor. Sleep, eat, exercise, and meditate. The C. If you do that on a daily basis and you relax, you gain your strength. You're able to be more effective as a person to manage yourself in the context of time and to be productive if you are able to take care of the biological and physiological needs first. Breathing, eating, drinking, being healthy, sleeping, meditating, relaxing. Because time management requires you to be relaxed, requires you to understand how, when to take a detour, when to go back to go forward, when to go slow to go fast. So you see, we are juggling among all these priorities every day. Can we do it? Yes, we can. And that's what I'll tell you today. So what are the benefits of time management? Which means managing self in the context of money, in the context of time. Because when you manage yourself, time is money. Think about it. Time management, Franklin, uh, Benjamin Franklin says, time is money. So I really, by managing yourself in the context of time, you are managing your cash flow. You are managing your success in a financial sense. So now what are the benefits? Think about it. If you manage self in the context of time, using the C metaphor, adequate sleep, eating healthy, exercising and meditating and relaxing, stress reduction, higher productivity, achieving your goals, which means what is important to you not to others, getting better results and the personal and the professional level, even at home. You have full control over your workload. And guess what? You have better relationship with peers, management, customers, etc. I don't know if you have seen Quincy series. I used to love Quincy the medical doctor, but right now on MeTV or FETV, there is a series now reviving Quincy. One of the episodes shows that Quincy really can't even go on a date because he is so meticulous in doing his coroner duties that many times he misses his dates because he wants to find why that person died. And then his girlfriend will come and say, Quincy, you let me hanging. I was waiting for you. So imagine when you control yourself in the context of time and you control your output and input, so to speak, you have better relationships. You will not miss a date. You will, miss, you will not miss an important uh, obligation or duty towards your boss, towards if you are a self-employed, towards your customer. Just imagine you, 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 you schedule a meeting with your customer and lo and behold, you are overworked, overloaded, things will fall through the cracks. Now you don't go to that meeting. You miss that date. What happens to you? Credibility erodes. Trust diminishes. And Managing self in the context of time is really liberating. 
Can you imagine to have full control? You can fly when you want to fly. You can take on your to-do list that day and achieve something amazing. You have achieved what you wanted to achieve that day. And yes, creates more free time and real time. See the beauty? The more you manage self in the context of time, frees you from the wasters, from the things that are urgent but not important and keeps you focused on the most important thing to succeed personally and professionally. And at the end of the day, it's fun to be in control of what you can do on a daily basis to achieve what you want to achieve on a daily basis. Now, let's talk about time wasters. And I bring to your attention that there are two kinds, self-imposed and imposed by others. That's why I want to start with those that are self-imposed, because many times we blame others. But in reality, before we start blaming others, we need to look at ourselves. Remember, managing self in the context of time. That means, are you aware of yourself? Really, to, to manage yourself in the context of time starts with self-awareness, which is really the beginning of social emotional learning. It's the beginning of EQ, emotional intelligence. Because if you can understand yourself, now all of a sudden you have the solution to your to-do list. Because if you know that you are a procrastinator, then you know how to avoid procrastination. If you have poor or negative attitude toward the task, you know that's going to be a block. You need now to change that attitude, to create a positive outlook towards the task. Yes, the task might be appear daunting, but guess what? Have you ever seen a mouse eating a big uh, 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 chunk of cheese? No. The mice will go and poke holes until that cheese becomes too. You see that Swiss cheese with all the holes? Once you put too many holes in the cheese, it crumbles. And once it crumbles, now the mouse can eat that whole a piece of cheese. That's how we do, we poke holes. We call that the Swiss cheese approach in dealing with our to-do list or with the daunting task. Fatigue, remember the C metaphor? Sleep, eat, exercise, and meditate? If, if you are fatigued, you will not be really managing yourself in the context of time. It's a waste to be fatigued. So that means when people go after work to a bar to drink and they stay till midnight or one before they go to sleep, they are going to really fatigue. In fact, we do a training on stress management and I read a book by an amazing Australian uh, 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 doctor who said, if you go to sleep after midnight, every hour that you sleep is equivalent to half an hour, which means if you go to sleep at 12.01 a.m. and you wake up at 8.01 a.m., you think, oh, I had an eight uh, uh, night uh, hour uh, of sleep at that night, no to your body is the equivalent of four hours. But if you go to sleep before midnight, every hour before midnight is the equivalent to two hours. Wow, which means if I went to sleep at 10 p.m. and I woke up at 4 p.m., it's the equivalent to eight hours. Is that a true statement? I'm one of those, I read something and I said, let me test it. So really for several nights, I stayed up till 12.01 and I, I don't kid you. It was, and I forced myself to go through three, four rounds of sleep. And by that morning, I was extremely exhausted. The next night, I went to sleep at 9 a.m. and I woke up at 3.34 a.m. I felt so energized. Wow, this is amazing. Why? Because it took a professor from Taiwan. I was teaching at Cal State San Bernardino, their MBA class as an orientation in this. Uh, and then he said, you know, Eddie, you are right because there is a study that shows that our body starts shutting off at specific time. So by 10.30 p.m. at 11 p.m., our lungs will start slowing down, our body starts slowing down, some operation will shut down in order when we go to sleep, we kick in about 65 operations to rebuild our bodies at the DNA level. Huh, imagine if you try to keep watching TV, what happens to your eyes? They become blurry, they become tired. Because your body says, shut your eye now. We need to repair it. Breathe slower. I need to repair it. Let the body slow down. That's why we slow down to go fast. During the day, we were on tear. At night, we repair. 
Wow, you see, by understanding these concepts, now we can manage ourselves in the context of time better. Lack of self-discipline. We need to build some discipline. Paper shuffling. How many times you are at your desk or now you are shuffling emails? You keep just meditating on them, looking at them, but doing nothing. That's really email shuffling. That's a time waster, self-employed. Socializing. When we come to work, we need to work. But sometimes people will go into the trap of uh, the water cooler conversations, socializing on the job. It's great to socialize, but also it's a time waster. Now, what about imposed by others? Interruptions. Now, there is a study that says in one hour, you get seven interruptions and you need five minutes to go back after every interruption right there. If you have one hour, seven interruptions times size 35 minutes. So in an hour, you are interrupted. 35 minutes is wasted because of the interruptions. So when you have something important, maybe close your door and said, I welcome you at, uh, at this moment. I'm thinking I'm working. I'll be available at that time and really focus on that part. So you are not getting interrupted. Look, you save 35 minutes of your time. If you do that in an hour, an eight hour time, look how much, how many minutes, how many hours you save that day. Deadlines. When people impose deadlines on you without knowing your to-do list and your own deadlines, it creates a time waster. That's why the trick here to ask people, you tell me to do it on such a day. Is this really the date? When do you need it by? Because at this moment, I'm working on one, two, three, four, five things. All of them have deadlines that come before yours. You'll realize many times, oh, no, no, I don't need it tomorrow. I need it a month from today. But people don't tell you that. So when people impose deadlines, ask the question, show them your priorities, show them what you are working on, and match the deadlines. So you are managing their expectation by giving you them your load and your perspective on things. Poor communication. Many times, especially today when people text, I prefer a phone call. I can manage things with one phone call versus text emails back and forth. Waste more people think by texting and emailing they're saving time. They're wasting more time. And it's really a, an area of miscommunication, misrepresentation and misunderstanding. The best thing to do, pick when something is important, you pick up the phone, you see someone in person, I can guarantee you it solves the issue quicker than going back and forth in emails and texts. Lack of instruction and training. Many times people cannot get to the intended result and they waste time because of free works and bad quality because they were never given the right instruction or the right skill or training. So, what are the areas related to time management then? Having a system, understanding the productivity pyramid, the scheduling and prioritizing techniques and the can-do attitude. And I love this picture, it says, I can't. Take that word out from your dictionary. One thing I learned in neuroscience and uh, brain research is if you tell the brain something negative, it will self-fulfill it, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It will make it happen for you. You want to have self-positive talk, not self-negative talk. So every time you don't look at something said, I cannot do it. Always look at something. Wow, I need to do this. How can I do it? You see the differences? I cannot versus how can I do it? Already you are triggering the, the element of curiosity in the brain. The brain is curious. When, when it sees a problem, critical thinking, public solving, decision-making kicks in. Now the brain says, it's a challenge. I love a challenge. Let's find a solution. And maybe the solution will come not just by you alone. In the multitude of counselors, there is accomplishment, brainstorming, ask others to help you. So always think of the can-do attitude, not the can. Take all the negatives out of the vocabulary. Even when you send a letter to anyone, don't say it's wrong. The word wrong, not, would not, could not, should not, and so forth. Take it out. There's always a positive approach to, uh, to, to address a problem rather than the negative approach. So I have a system. Notice one system. Many times people have a manual system and then they have a digital system within the digital system. Just Google something from the Pomodoro technique to this, to that, to apps. Look how many apps. Too complicated. 
Believe it or not, I don't use the apps. I use a very single, a simple approach, the old way. I have a calendar and everything goes on my calendar and nothing falls through the cracks. Others will use an app. Others will use the calendar and so forth. Find a system, but make it one system. Because when you multiply systems, it becomes tedious to, uh, to maintain and things will fall through the cracks. I'm not talking about redundancy to create a backup. Have a backup. Your email system could be a backup, but your calendar, your follow-up should be in one system. Here is a beautiful um, matrix. I love matrices. I created matrices for everything in how to collect an account, how to do credit assessment, how to do negotiation. There is always a matrix like ability and willingness matrix. But here in time management or managing self in the context of time, I love this important, not important, urgent, not important matrix. And here is the trick. Notice the word important. What do you see? The first two words. First, the word starts with an I. It sounds like I. That means it's me, I. Urgent, look at the first letter, you. You, you are. Think I. Now, important, put an astrophe between the I and M becomes I am, I become the verb to be. So you see, that's very important. That's the foundation. If you want to be productive, look at your priorities. Look at the I, what's important. First, you look at what's important, then important at, and urgent, and then important, not urgent is always, that is the key that we're going to learn today. If you can master that quadrant, which most people feel, oh, I cannot do that because I don't have time. I wanna show you today, yes, we all have time to be dealing with the important uh, uh, and not urgent. But sad to say, look at the next one. Most people today are ventured to say they are in quadrant number three and four. Quadrant three is urgent, but not important. This is really, we deal with noise and urgent and important. You'll be surprised. Don't be fooled by the word important plus urgent. Urgent and important means it's important to other people first. Maybe minimally important to you, but really it's the priority of others. So urgent and important is the quadrant of necessity. It touches you and it touches other people. But most importantly, when something is urgent, it's other people's priorities are at stake. For example, I'm a customer. I bought uh, an item from your establishment. The item broke. Now it's urgent to me, important to me to be fixed. I call you. Now it's also important because my loyalty and goodwill is at stake. You have to fix it. But guess what? That should not have happened if you had good quality control. If we, when, when the person bought it, somebody made sure that they instructed the, the individual how to use that item. Because sometimes people break the item because lack of instruction and they didn't know how to operate or to use it. Therefore, it broke. Now it's defective. They come to you to replace it or to get a refund. So anytime you have urgent and important, really, it is the priority of others that made it important to you to fix now. Urgent and not important, it's really you are fighting fires all the time, noise around you. It's really uh, some, somebody's priority through deadlines and interruption, other things that are making it important to you, but it is not really. It's, that's why I call it the quadrant of deception. It's urgent, but not necessarily important. What about not important, not urgent? That is the quadrant of waste. What do we do with waste? We eliminate waste, which means when you look at these four quadrants, I wanted to focus on quadrant number two. That's where leadership comes. This is the quadrant of prevention, planning, maintenance, values, recreation. This is where companies do strategic planning. This is where individual companies recreate, so to speak. They come up with ideas, they brainstorm, they write manuals, they train uh, their, their employees, they create an L&D, learning and development programs. They are progressive individuals and so forth. That is very important because taking the time to read an article will give you a skill or will grow your skill to make things faster, better, and cheaper in your company. Process improvement takes time. That is the quadrant of leadership. That's sad to say, we all are living in the quadrant of necessity. I need to do this. I need to do this. 
If you need it because it's important to you, fantastic. But if you need it because it's important to others, you are being deceived and you are wasting precious time and resources and efforts. In the first place, if you do high quality service, high quality product, everything is done right, zero defect mentality, then guess what? You are not going to be neither fighting fires or really dealing with noise or wasting time. You will always be leading in your, uh, in your business and in your industry. Here are the examples of urgent, crisis, pressing, problems, deadlines, fighting fires. Even COVID, when it started, it became urgent and important because it was life and death. What is not urgent? Preparing, planning, values, relationship building. Ha, huh? if you are a salesperson, a marketing person, a CEO of a company, even if you are an HR, if you are a manager, are you taking time to build strong relationships with your employees, with your staff, with your customers, and even cities, with city council, with elected officials, with everybody around you, with the community? You see, the relationship building is not just on a, a one dimensional. It has multi-dimensions that we need to be dealing with, the personal, the professional, the community, the governance, and so forth. Training and learning. Are we taking time every day to learn something new and train to be at the top of our game? Prevention. Huh. Pre announce that prevention is better than a pound of cure. Empowerment to recreation. What about urgent not important? Again, interruptions, some phone calls, extra activities, some reports, the time wasters, phone calls, emails, junk mail, and even some activities. So these matrices really open your eyes to a lot of things. But now the question is, how many minutes or percentage of the day I should really be dealing with all of these? Believe it or not, this is how you want to do it. Not urgent, the leadership, 80% of your time of more should be on the not urgent important. 15% or less in the quarter of necessity. 4.99% in the quadrant of deception, 0 0.01 in the quadrant of waste. Personally, I would prefer to be 90% in the leadership and the rest should make no more than 10%. And if I can even make it 95.5, 98.2 will be even better, but that's a perfect world. But in an imperfect world, this is really a possible formula to follow that most people can do. And I tested it and it works. Now, when you look at these quadrants, look at the results. If you are always in the quadrant of necessity, finding fires, I can guarantee you stress, burnout, crisis management, always putting out fires. But if you are in the quadrant of deception, that short-term focus, crisis management, out of control, you feel victimized. If you are in the quadrant of waste, total irresponsibility, failed result, lots of control, and even insolvency and bankruptcy on the personal level sometimes and on the business level. But look at the quadrant of leadership, vision, perspective, balance, control, and yes, few crises in life. Wow, where do you want to be now? You want to be in quadrant one, three, and four, or would you like to be in quadrant number two? It's very obvious. And here is a beautiful, remember that was the matrix, because if you can master that matrix, I can tell you any to-do list will be mastered. Any issue, whether it's at home, in your personal life, in your relationships, at work, if you, if you master that matrix, everything becomes fun. It becomes a breeze, becomes challenge, but good challenge. It's not a crisis, it becomes a challenge to find solutions. And here is the second tool I'd like to share with you. It, it came from Italy, from an Italian economist, Vilfredo Pareto. They call it the uh, uh, Pareto Principle, and we call it the 80-20 rule. Now, I, we can make it 90-10 rule, but let's go by what Vilfredo Pareto saw. He really saw that really, when you look at input versus output, he realized 80% of the output comes from 20% of your input. Now, we're not talking that input is simple. It could be very complex. Now, if we take the same uh, uh, issue into your to-do list, I can guarantee you there is a lot of noise on your to-do list. Maybe you have 10 items that you need to do today or 100 items. But if you go in onto the uh, and really make a complete study of your to-do list, you might find out of this 100 items, maybe 
20 items are very important and they will get me maximum result. But those 20 items require notice because it's important they will require time. And in the instant gratification mentality, people feel, oh, time is money. I, ca I cannot, no. Look at those 20% that are the problems that need solutions. The, the, for example, in collection, look at your portfolio. Who owes you the million dollar? Not those who owe you $10 to $100. You might have a thousand of those, but you might have few clients, 10% that owes you 100,000, 150,000, million to million dollar. If I did a collection technique, I'll go after the 20%. Those with $100,000 and up, I start with the million down and I can guarantee you not too many people owe you a million dollars. So it stands the reason 20% of my portfolio will get me more than 80% resolve. If I started calling the million dollar ones, then 800,000, then half a million, and then 100,000, by the time I come to those who owe me $10, $20, $100, $1,000, if I achieve the result on the top, I achieve maximum cash flow. So the same thing, the 80-20 rule. 20% of your input items of the on your to-do list will get you 80% result, which means 80% on your to-do list will get you 20% result. Now I need to match my efforts. If 20% give me 80% result, I need to put 80% effort on those 20 to get 80% result. And if 80% gives me 20% result, 20% of my time and effort will be spent on those 80 items that will give me only 20% result. See, that is the logic here. So if you can also master this 80-20 rule, and if you can make it either 85-15 or 90-10 rule, will be amazing. And you'll be a far more productive and happier individual. Sharon Stone said, I like to drive with my knees. Otherwise, how can I put on my lipstick and talk on the phone? In essence, what she is really telling us that we want to multitask. Here is the bad news. We all do it. When you need to do something important, do not multitask. Why? Brain research and neuroscience tells me that the brain hates multitasking. Our brain is directional. Our brain is linear. Our brain wants one, two, three, four, five. Yes, notice what the brain does every, every minute. We are scanning billions of bits of information, but the brain says too much confusion and it makes things into a proper uh, uh, sequence. Our brain loves to do one thing and finish it, then move to the next thing and finish it. When we multitask, we fragmented our brain. Therefore, you think you are producing more. In reality, you are producing less. Notice what happens. We say practice practice makes perfect. If you are doing one, one activity and you try to do it one after the other, what happens? The body builds a rhythm. Rhythm creates savings. If you save one second, if you are stuffing envelopes, the more you stuff the envelopes the, uh, and the better the rhythm, the faster you are going to become. That's exactly how the brain is. Tell the brain to do one thing. It becomes great at that. Then you can take a break and then start the other thing. That's what the brain likes. But when we multitask, we have affected our productivity. People don't know that. Anonymous, before you can score, you must first have a goal. Huh? Do you have a goal? Your to-do list is a form of a plan. Plans have goals, which means when you look at your to-do list, the first thing you want to do is, I have 100 items. Narrow it down to the key items that you want to achieve that day that becomes your goal. Only then you're going to be able to achieve those items. Otherwise, you are going to be confused. You don't know where to start. Don't pick and choose. Every day you have to categorize your to-do list as what is highest priority to the least priority, the most critical to the least critical, the most important to the least important, and what are the time wasters. If we categorize that, then you can start cranking each category and achieving maximum result. Which means this new technique, this new tool will help you. We call that the productivity pyramid. Why it's a pyramid? It starts from the top, the governing values. And they are going to control and really and guide you into your daily goals. Notice the bottom of the pyramid is daily. Why? Because you have many daily goals. But 
there will be lesser short term, lesser intermediate, lesser long range goals, but all of them are guided by your governing values. Which means subject every goal to your values, meaning what is your value? Do you value time? Time is money. Do you value cash flow? Managing self in the context of time will allow you to bring more cash, uh, solve more and uh, more issues, improve your processes, takes time, but it will save time in the long run by saving you money, being more productive, more efficient, and so forth. So really, what are your governing value? Honesty, transparency, accountability. We say zero excuses, 100% accountability. If that is a governing uh, value, I can guarantee you, if you are accountable first to yourself and to your team and to the company and to the community, then you are going to be a far more productive individual. So this pyramid of productivity is an amazing tool. Here's something, this is a hodgepodge. I found them in different books, but mostly Stephanie Winston, back in the 1990s, she wrote a series of books on being organized, amazing. So this is an extract and I modified it from other newsletters that I read. But what we need to know is classify your action into items and classify your task items into. See, what you need to do in life is you say, what do I want to do? Then what action do I need to take to achieve that goal or that to do uh, the item on my to-do list? What are the tasks that I need to pursue to make that happen for the action to be completed and the goal to be achieved? What are the items that I need to fulfill within that task? See, see how beautiful you start my goal. I need to act. These are the tasks. And these are the items within the task. When we do that, now, if we take our tasks, here is where also physiology comes into play. Are you a lark or are you an owl or are you a third bird? Uh, I read an article the other day. What does it mean? It means some people are night owls. They function at night. Others function better in the morning. Other functions better at midday, which means look at your bodies, look at your rhythm, biorhythm. Believe it or not, every single one of us, we have a rhythm daily, weekly, monthly. Through that rhythm, you're going to find out we have what we call mental rhythm, biological rhythm, energy rhythm, and so forth. When is your prime time? The prime time is when you have high energy. When is your medium time, your medium energy? When is your downtime, your low energy? Now, look at your items. What are the high impact, medium, low impact? Now match. If an item is of low impact, then you need low energy. Do that during your downtime. If something is medium impact, you need medium energy. Look at your rhythm. When is my medium energy time? And if something of high impact it requires high energy, I need my prime time. Like for me, I'm an author. Sometimes my prime time is at three, four in the morning. If I dream of an idea, I get up, I start writing. Believe it or not, by 7 a.m., a beautiful article or a chapter was written. That is my prime time. I condition myself to be in the zone. So are you, do you know your zone where you are going to be downtime, medium, and prime time? If you are able to understand that, you are going to be far more productive. Why? Because, you know, my downtime, let me do all these time wasters. Yes, there is junk email. I have to look at it. I can delete it. Do that during your downtime, but reserve your high energy prime time for the things that are important and your medium time with those that are urgent and important. You see, by understanding this slide is going to open your eyes to, oh, now what's on my to-do list? Okay, uh, uh, th this is the item, great. In order to do this item, what actions, what tasks, what items? Great. Is this uh, 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 item my to-do list is really uh, just looking at junk mail? Great. I can put that for the end of the day or when I'm during downtime. Oh, this is important. Follow up with a customer. First thing in the morning, I have to do that. Oh, this customer owes me $2 million in bad, uh, uh, bad debt or past due bills. I need to call them immediately the first thing in the morning. I want them to give, I want to give time to them to look at my invoices, my statements, so they can start acting on paying me and so forth. See, by understanding this classification, this taxonomy is going to help you to be a far more a productive individual that also help you with 
being self-aware of your energy levels, of your physiology and biological makeup, or of your biorhythm. And this is a real science. Uh, I learned that many, many years ago when I used to be a tour guide in Israel, in Jerusalem, and a French lady came and said, yes, Eddie, do you know about biorhythm? I said, explain it to me. And when, I, when she explained it to me, I started getting A's in everything I do in college because I realized, hmm, I better study the tough things when I'm at my high uh, energy level rather than my low energy level. It helps in your studies and in doing things uh, that you wanna achieve higher results. Scheduling and prioritizing, very important. You need to do that on a daily basis. I, I do it even in the evening. I look at my daily to-do list I now schedule the next day that moment, not in the morning of the next day. But when I get up in the morning and said, okay, what did I schedule to do today? I will review it and I will classify it. What comes first, second, third, and I want maximum impact and maximum result. But I'm always reminded of this beautiful Chinese proverb. A journey of a thousand miles must begin with a single step. I wondered about this. Why didn't they say a journey of a thousand miles must begin with the first mile, with the first yard? Notice what it says, with a single step. Procrastination requires the first step, the first action, which means nothing happens if we don't start. When we start, start with the first step of any project, any task, so yeah. You can reach a thousand miles of productivity and result if you take the first step towards that achievement. Scheduling, what are the two, uh, what do you need to know is have a to-do list. And guess what? There is no uh, right and wrong. You can have your own to-do list. There are apps that can help you with that. But two things you need to understand. When you have a to-do list, have a master list in between understand the sources of the to-do list. Meaning, if I'm working for a boss, the first thing I want to do on my to-do list, you have to have things that you have to do for yourself as a person, for you in professional development, for your department, for your boss, for your boss's boss, for the department head, for the president of the company, and for the community if there are regulators and auditors and so forth. Now, what is the source? A lot of people make a mistake when the boss tells them to do something, they relegate that to the bottom and they do what they want to do. Wrong. There are priorities. The priority comes from the top down and then from the bottom up. That means when the president of the company tells my boss to do something as if he told me or she told me to do it. So that means whatever the president of the company needs to do, I will focus that first because get them off your back. Get that gorilla off your back. Then when you, when you come to the second one, so in reality, there are pr priorities. There is an elephant sitting on you now because believe it or not, there is pressure. Try to go up to Mount Everest. Where do you think you have more pressure on you? Yes, on the bottom, you have more pressure of air, but pressure to exist and to breathe. It's so hard to breathe at 29,035. That's why you need oxygen. So really you have to, Respect height. Position is height. When the president of the company says, I need something, that is very important to for, for me to continue living at that level of demand. I need to achieve that. My boss tells me to do something. I follow what my boss needs to do. My peers tell me, my customer tells me, the customer is the king, the boss. I will do what the customer says. Then my peers and then what I need. You see? become selfless, self-sacrificing. You sacrifice self because of the good of many. But when you do that, you are going to self-achieve. Self-actualization is when you first give others to fulfill their aspiration and their dreams. And in return, they help you to achieve your dreams and aspirations. This is really a rule that not too many people understand. Satisfy your customer, no, delight your customer, you will be delighted and satisfied. Delight your manager who is your customer, then you will be delighted and satisfied. Then ultimately you will be satisfied. So this is the hierarchy. Understand the source. It makes you a far more productive and happier individual. 
If you chase two rabbits, what happens? Both will escape. Have you ever tried that? Rabbits are fast. I, I, I lived in Kentucky on a, on a, a horse farm and then Every morning, deer and rabbit will come and try to try to catch a rabbit. It's impossible. You might if they get stuck, but they are faster. But now have two rabbits going in a different direction. It's impossible. You can be going in two directions. Have you ever seen a car on a freeway going forward and backward at the same time? You can only go in one direction. Go after one rabbit and chase it. And even then it's going to be uh, difficult. So don't chase two rabbits. Both will escape. I love Thomas Alva Edison, a very prolific inventor. And imagine he himself in the eight, late 1800s. In fact, here is a page from his diary. Notice what he says. Th the TAE is Thomas Alva Edison. Notice January 3rd, 1888. Things doing and things to be done. I love that. Notice what that things doing, present, now, and things to be done, future. So a to-do list has to have both, not what you have done. It's history. It's the past. In managing self in the context of time is really being in the present and then going into the future. And look what he said. There is a cotton picker, new standard for a phonograph, how uh, uh, hand-turning phonograph, new slow open uh, uh, and cheap uh, dynamo. And look at this. You, you get an insight into the mind of one of the greatest inventors, Thomas Alva Edison. Prioritizing. When you prioritize something, always have a priority code. You can classify actions important and not and urgent, or important and not important. Classify task, okay, if this is important, one, two, three. And now task into items, A, B, C. A is more important than B, more important than C and so forth. This is how you're going to do it. So have a system. Now, if you want to juggle among multiple priorities, what do you need to do? There is a tool. We call that can do, which means see, check your attitude. I love it because remember one of the self-imposed wasters is procrastination, is your own mindset. Why do we procrastinate? Because we either feel inadequate, we feel we don't have the tools, the skills, or the confidence. So we hesitate, check your attitude. I can do this. I will find the way to do this. Once you check your attitude, positive self-talk, now be realistic. A, assess your weaknesses and your strengths. There is nothing wrong about weaknesses. What, what's wrong is not to realize that you have them, but you need to understand your strength. Once you uh, identify your strength, find someone on your team that will substitute for the weakness you have. Now you're leveraging strength and nail down an organizational method. Again, system, a method. And D, divide and conquer your workload. Start. You don't win a battle overnight. You don't win a war without a series of battles. So, and then, oh, overcome procrastination. You see, your attitude and procrastination are the bookends because most probably your attitude is based on something that a lot that will help you to procrastinate. If you check the attitude and eliminate the procrastination, now it's a can-do attitude. There are nine steps to juggling multiple priorities. The first thing is set your goals. Goals alone get you nowhere. Have a plan. A plan alone gets you nowhere. Organize. And now part of organization, have a to-do list. There, wonderful, is having a beautiful feast on a table, but not doing anything. Eat, lead the charge, start eating to benefit. Then measure your progress. Learn to choose wisely to stay healthy. Start with the most critical and important, and then apply the 80-20 rule. So you see how we bring everything together? Everything we talked about, I can go on days going deeper and deeper into every line that you see in this presentation. So a synthesis which means let's put it all together, a study management approach. Start with your long range goals, values, and objectives. Remember the pyramid? What are your values? What do you wanna achieve? What are your goals? Long-term, medium, and short-term. Relate the day's activities to those goals. What are you going today doing to be done later? Like uh, Thomas Alva Edison. 
schedule, study time, task goals, and activity. Notice, even as a worker, are you a progressive learner? A study time means not just going to a book to a classroom. I use this with the students in high school, but also as a CEO, as an individual, as a staff. Do you take time to study, to be up to date on your industry? I'm a professional. Every year I have to do 60 hours of continuous learning if I want to be in the credit field. Doctors, lawyers, professionals do that. Take time. Assign priorities. Execute. Then stay on track. Like when you are driving a car, you need to look at the dashboard. Do you have a control mechanism, a dashboard that will keep you going on track? Be disciplined. And yes, if need be, reschedule and reprioritize. People think, oh, I cannot do that. Yes, you can. In fact, I will teach you a technique. We call that the Harvard technique. You can have 100 items on your to-do list. The brain can only handle three things. Every day, every to-do list, isolate the top three things you want to achieve. Something amazing happens. When you achieve these three, the brain will kick in to achieve as many items after that. There is some am amazing mechanism that the brain kicks in. Oxytocin, and this is the endorphins that you get, and the dopamine to feel, wow, I achieved. Now you become your own cheerleader. Why do you think people score high in ball games? Because they have cheerleaders around them. Because when you achieve one goal, now you become a cheerleader to yourself. Oh, wow, great. Let's go now to the next goal. Oh, great. Now let's go to the third. By the time you get three types of cheerleading, achievement, all of a sudden, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, you become unconquerable, invincible. And that's exactly when you understand self, when you manage self in the context of, of time, you become unconquerable, invincible, the best you can become. But notice what Chesterfield says. If you want to make time count, not only count time, take care of the minutes and the hours will take care of themselves. I love that because many times when we look at a big to-do list, we think in terms, oh my God, I need to achieve all of this. No, start with the minutes, start with the seconds because if the seconds count, the minutes will count, the hours will count, the day will count, the week will count. And lo and behold, you achieve the extraordinary things on the personal and the professional. And this is really amazingly, we finish just on uh, exactly so we can allow some uh, Q and A because if not, I can give you more insights and tips. And I wanna share also with you uh, the, the uh, Let's Grow Glendale webinar series. Today you have witnessed the first one, but now the second one will be on effective negotiation strategies. I can guarantee you this is amazing. We all negotiate, and if you are in business or even you're working for anyone, you negotiate with yourselves, you negotiate with your families, you negotiate with the community, with your, negotiate your race, etc. Very important to understand. Then a customer service adventure, cash flow management with a twist. This is amazing if you are in business. That is my passion, help you to maximize your cash flow, mastering financial literacy, and then the fine art of credit management, because it's not just management, it's if you are in business, how do you manage your credit? And I want to share with you even a testimonial that I received uh, many years ago, and it's still applicable. This lady, uh, in fact, didn't want to attend any time management because she thought she had attended a lot. But then she was uh, very much uh, um, excited to send me this feedback. She says, Eddie, she called me, says, I attended your time management workshop this morning, and I wanted to thank you for your comprehensive insight. I've attended a few webinars on this subject in the past and continue to struggle with time management. However, today you broke everything down in a way that feels realistic and, and double and doable, she wanted to say here. That's her, her wording. As someone who feels consistently overwhelmed with the amount of tasks on my list, the tools you provided give me hope that I'll be able to prioritize my time appropriately. Appreciate you taking the time to speak today. Best wishes. She took the time to call me. This is what I really am impressed. I'm one of those, when I listen to a webinar, when I go in person I, uh, and the speakers say from the stage, anytime you need help, call me. I'll test them. I'll go and, and see them after uh, the, the event and I'll call them. You'll be surprised. In my history, I've been to thousands of workshops. I can't remember more than less than 10 people that actually meant it. I can count all the speakers worldwide, not just the worldwide. They said to the audience, call me, communicate with me. I'll communicate with you personally. I returned the call. Less than 10 people did that. 
but don't be uh, disheartened. Those 10 people, amazing. I wrote books interviewing these people. So one or two is enough for me. Less than 10 is fantastic. So to me, I mean it when I say, if you need something, contact me, contact the city of Glendale, Jennifer, uh, David, the team, and you will always hear from me because that's what I believe in the personal touch. Because I manage my, myself in the context of time, but most importantly, keep building relationship, human touch, and that trust that you build is your reputation and your character. So I thought with this, uh, I will now turn it back to David and Jennifer, and thank you very much for being here and for all those who will be listening to this recording. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eddie. A really, really, truly fantastic talk and, and really wonderful information that has some salient takeaways. You know, the, the I love the grid that you laid out of important uh, versus urgent and the framing of uh, I versus you. It's such a great way to remember that. Uh, and it's something that I will speak for myself. I definitely, uh, that was helpful to me. So I imagine that was helpful for others that are on the call, you know, being able to filter through all the tasks and figure out kind of wh where things lie, where we want to be, how we can strategically set ourselves up to be in that top right corner so that we're able to, um, to spend more time more effectively and really in a more high functioning manner uh, instead of just reacting constantly. Because uh, that's, you know, something that definitely uh, plagues all of us. And I feel like the more involved you are with with frontline operations, uh, the more difficult it is to peel yourself away from that reaction. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a very useful framework for us all to use. So I'll open it up to, uh, to the audience. If there are any questions that anyone has, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and, or just write them in the chat. Um, and we can dive into those questions now. I don't know why I posed that as a question. <laughs> we can dive into those questions now. <laughs> Lydia, I saw that you unmuted yourself for a second. I'm not sure if that was by accident or if you were uh, trying to ask a question. Nope, looks like it was by accident. I have a question, Eddie. What are your thoughts on the um, two-minute rule? Two-minute rule, from what angle? Because there's a lot of things uh, on the web. What do you understand by that first? Um, so the two-minute rule is if you have a task that's going to take you less than two minutes to complete, do it now versus putting it off. Good, so this is a technique like in the Pomodoro technique, they say, do things in increments of 25 minutes, but sometimes you hear two minutes. In essence, that might not be applicable. That's why sometimes when we use rules, it might not be applicable to everyone, like two minutes. Maybe a task is three minutes. It could be five minutes. What I always say, create a, a broader category, meaning it's easier to say, is this wasteful or not? Most wasteful things will take will really take less than 30 seconds even. So I will always say, if anything is going to take few seconds to few minutes, that means you can do it. Because in, a, in how many five minutes or two minutes in an hour, there are 30 segments of two minutes and you have 12 segments of five minutes. That's huge if you can eliminate those items from your to-do list. So yes, the two, the two minute rule, I mean, if anything that takes lesser time, do it first, but don't do it first in the day unless you feel, some people, when I used to do collection, will say to the collectors, 8 a.m. to 8.15, you do this, 8.15 to 8.30. Maybe you can say all those two minutes or less, I will do them between 8 a.m. at 8.15. 8.15 comes, move on to something else. And then go back after lunch, because your brain is trying to be to arrive into work, then you can do those items. So you can create categories between 8 to 8.15, 1 to 1.15 after lunch and before you leave, uh, like quarter to five, 
at, at uh, to five o'clock, you finalize the last thing and you do your uh, uh, thing. Yeah, the two minute rule is just an eye opener to say, is it time waster? Can you do it quickly? But don't be engrossed. I've seen people like me playing games. What happens when people play solitaire? You'll be surprised. Have you timed yourself on solitaire? It, it takes less than two minutes. <laughs> but what happens when you are involved in a solitaire? Uh, I, I play that all the time so, because I love that for brain thing. Sometimes you get challenged. It takes you sometimes up to one hour to solve one deck. Most of the decks will solve in two minutes or less. So don't be stuck into that. Even though two minutes or less or five minutes or less, make yourself a deadline. I can only deal with those between this time to that time and come and revisit them later. Otherwise, you will be like that solitaire game. You will be hooked on those two, two minutes or less. And, and hours later, you are still working on the two minutes or less. I tested that, believe it or not. So, But this is good. Excellent, Jennifer. Did I did I answer you? You did. Thank you. And again, pulling from that framework, Eddie, I'm wondering if you know that would be a good way to figure out what things might fit within that two minute rule. If they fall within, you know, urgent and important, then okay, maybe this needs attention now. Uh, but otherwise, is it really that important? to you or urgent to others that it needs to take place of whatever you're doing right now. So I, again, I love that framework. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I think that's why uh, I came up with the I versus you because a lot of people are fighting fires. They keep using said urgent, urgent, urgent. In reality, urgent to whom? Not to you, to someone else. What's urgent to you in their mind is very important. So they create urgency because it's important to them. And they're trying to ask you, they are delegating their important things to you through the urgency. So that's why the I versus you will say, okay, let me put on the break. Whose uh, urgency, whose importance I'm working on. I need to be working on my important things to self-actualize, believe it or not, as an individual to self-actualize, to do the job right in my department. I need to focus on the important things. But if people keep calling me with a fire every few minutes with their important things that are urgent now to me to, to function, and they make it so urgent, I wasted a lot of time dealing with noise and uh, putting fires. And sad to say, this is what most companies do. So they, they don't, that's why strategic planning, when I talk to the CEOs of companies and said, Eddie, we don't have time to strategic planning. They're forgetting strategic planning is the most important thing for them. That's leadership, that's preparation, that's strategy. And they don't even find time for that because they're fighting sales, they're finding marketing, they're fighting fires with their clients and so forth. Yeah, it's, it's really an art, uh, David. This is an art. It's individualized. You have to look at your goals. That's why the pyramid uh, the, uh, of productivity is huge. Look at your governing values. And look at the source of your to-do list. If I take these two things, my governing values and the, and the uh, delegating source to me, I'm one of the sources, self-imposed to the list. But then my bosses, the community, compliance. Look at when COVID came on. Now it's no longer the company. It's what the environment and government is telling us to do and not to do. From uh, social distancing, masking, not coming to work. Look what they created now, remote work, hybrid work. You see what happens in one area now created different priorities, different importance and so forth. And sad to say, we don't have control over some of the compliance issue. We have to comply with and then work with that. Good. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I have a follow-up question for that actually. Uh, you know, you mentioned delegation briefly um, and I'm wondering, you know, what, is there a threshold, I guess, for when, if you are a business leader and your time is being so consumed by putting out fires and by dealing with um, things just in a purely reactive manner, is there a threshold that you see where at a certain point, you know, just your inability to have uh, that strategic visioning and that strategic planning available, uh, just the time to do that available to you um, 
kind of requires you to ha to seek additional help to hire an extra person. You know, even if it's you know, at what point is is the cost of hiring someone additional um, really? I guess uh, you know, is is the cost outweighed by your ability to have that longer term view? I like this question because it has many layers, David. The first thing I will approach this is why is the leader in a situation that they're overwhelmed and they cannot carry their uh, assignment or what they want to do in a timely manner without being uh, 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 in a situation fighting fires? I will use a technique, PPT, people, processes, technology. When I do process improvement, I always look at the people with a person, the processes, the technology. Now, when it comes to delegation and the leader, I said, first of all, the leader. I'll start with the leader. What are the, 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 uh, the visions and mission that the leader is going to accomplish? What are the skills that the leader possess? Then did the leader do the right thing by forming the right team around him or her? Because believe it or not, before you delegate, you delegate is by, because you cannot do. You, have, you need others to do. So first, can the leader do it? Second, can, for example, um, the team help you in executing some of the items? Because I believe leadership is a team sport. It is not just one person. A department has a manager. Therefore, a department is a team sport. So if everybody works together, I start with the leader and said, what do they have? What do they lack? Now, did they recruit the right team around them? Does the team have the resources, the skill, the vision, and the mission to complete what the leader vision and missions are? And then is the leader self-aware of what is happening? And each one on the team are always self-aware of the big picture. And then if, for example, we realize that, yes, the vision is bigger than the leader and the team, that justifies not only delegation, but hiring more people to help. Like, well, like when you send soldiers to the battle, you cannot send a team of 10 to counter a million. So then you have a bigger uh, army to counter that million. So we are all involved in team building. So everything starts, remember, the pyramid of productivity from the governing values. When it comes to corporations, three things we, we ask. What's your vision? What's your mission? What are your values? That is the governing uh, uh, part. Everything else comes. How many departments, how many leaders, staff, people we need to carry out that mission to achieve that vision? If that's where we justify. If we feel we don't have the budget to justify, then we kick into process improvement mode. Who is on the team? What do they lack? So the leader will ask everyone on the team, we need to achieve this. Can we do it? What do we need to do it? How do we need to do it? How can we really, be, maybe we need more training, more instruction, more development. And it doesn't have to be long L&D. Uh, learning and development could be in microbursts. It could be something quick. The team comes together. Don't work individually, work collectively. While individually, we become accountable to self and to the team. So that's why this, this is an amazing question you brought because the word delegation, what do I delegate? Many times you delegate things that others can do better than you. You never delegate your core. That means a leader cannot delegate leadership, cannot delegate their task and their role, but they can delegate things that the team needs to achieve on their behalf. Delegation doesn't mean abdication. A lot of people think, I delegate it to you, therefore you do it, and um, I wash my hands. You cannot do that. Delegation is not abdication. When I delegate something, I want to make sure I delegate it to the right person, with the right skills, with the right tools, and with the right objectives and instruction to achieve. Because just delegating something to someone that don't know what to do, that's not delegation, that's abdication. When we delegate, we make sure we follow up on the results. We keep communicating with the person that we delegated to, ask about their progress, what they need, how are they doing, how far are they from achieving the goal? So that's why, the person who delegates becomes the coach, becomes the cheerleader. 
because they are doing that on behalf of the leader, behalf of the manager. But the manager cannot just leave them to their own devices. You have to be at their side, guiding them, because ultimately, once they achieve that, you achieved your vision and your mission. See, that's how delegation is really a team sport. I delegate and I will follow up, communicate, keep working until that person achieves it. But that person has to be the right person. So excellent question, David. I love it. And the the small bursts of of learning, it's you know, it's exactly what we're doing here with this series. So this was a fantastic start to the series. We really thank you again for your time today. And thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. Uh, as a reminder, we have three of these before the Small Business Summit and then three that are gonna be following up afterwards. So our next one is gonna be on April 9th, same time, same place. Uh, so 9.30 a.m. to 10, 11 o'clock a.m. On, on April 9th. Um, and we will be focusing on, on effective negotiation strategies. Uh, so Eddie's going to be leading that one as well. Uh, we do have a survey that we're going to be sharing about this um, event today. Uh, so we'll drop that in the chat. And then I believe we'll also send it out afterwards. We really value your feedback on these surveys. We want to make sure that they are addressing the topics that are relevant for you, all the things that you are going through right now and experiencing within uh, your pursuit for growing your small business. Um, and Again, hearkening back to the, the uh, comment that Eddie had earlier, you know, this process of learning can be in incremental bursts um, or it can be in larger chunks. Um, and so one of those larger chunks that we have coming up is our Small Business Summit, uh, which is going to be in May this year. It's going to be on May 2nd. Um, and we are going to be uh, really diving deeper into a lot of the resources that are available to all of you uh, for growing your business, for um, just the different programs that are available, different tips and tricks um, to, to really drive uh, efficiency and to drive effective business practices um, so that you all can, can really optimize your practice, optimize your passion uh, in this space. So we hope that you'll join us. Um, we'll go ahead and drop the link to the Small Business Summit in the chat in case, I'll go ahead and do that now, Jen, um, in case you haven't gotten a chance to sign up for that yet. Um, but it's gonna be an absolutely fantastic uh, series of talks. And again, thank you, Eddie, this is wonderful. Um, we look forward to seeing everyone back here on April 9th and, and spread the word. You know, the more people that we have having these conversations, the more we can create a community around small businesses and really make sure that we're looking out for each other and that we're looking out for uh, our own strategic interests and, and growing our, um, our ability to do the things that we want to do here in the city of Glendale. So thank you everyone. We really appreciate you all being here with us today. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Thank you very much. Hey, um, we, I, there was a quick question if the slides will be available to everyone or would it just be available on the recording, the slides? You know, go ahead and make it available for everyone. That's fine with me. Okay, perfect. So yeah. then I'll go ahead and email everyone the slides. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything to help the small business? <laughs> Well said. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eddie. Right. Great, pres great, day, great presentation. Yeah, you're welcome.